I'd like to start off this section on trauma by offering a null hypothesis concerning trauma. The null hypothesis goes, trauma shmama, who cares? Well, this is Nadine Burke Harris's response to that. This is how she starts her 2014 TED Talk. In the mid-90s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for seven out of ten of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And yet doctors today are not trained in routine screening or treatment. Now, the exposure I'm talking about is not a pesticide or a packaging chemical. It's childhood trauma. If you've never watched Dr. Burke Harris's 2014 TED Talk, I really would urge you to hit the pause button, Google it, and watch it first. Uh, it's only 16 minutes long, and the material in that TED Talk will help you understand everything about the material that I present in this video. And in truth, what she has to say is way more important than anything that I'm covering in these videos. But that said, Dr. Burke Harris refers to the Adverse Childhood Experiences studies in this talk, uh, the ACEs studies. And if you're not familiar with the ACEs material, the ACEs studies are the most important research that most Americans have never heard of. I've made a deliberate decision not to do a segment on the ACEs in this series because there's so much good literature out there that does a better job than I would ever be able to do. Um, but if you're not familiar with the ACEs studies, again, I'd really urge you to Google some videos and, and review them because the ACEs research is the most important literature most important research findings that most Americans have never heard of. So now that we've established that trauma is actually important, what is trauma? Well, here's a fairly academic and a comprehensive definition, and excuse me if I read. Trauma is the psychological or physical damage that results from overwhelming stress that exceeds one's ability to cope and integrate the emotions that result from a dangerous experience or witnessing a dangerous experience. A good comprehensive academic definition, which as I've just demonstrated, is pretty difficult to remember. I actually like Elaine Miller Karras's definition, which is shorter, easier to remember, probably because it's intuitive. Trauma is too much, too fast, or Trauma is too little for too long. Now, if you bring to mind the resiliency zone graphic, perhaps you can imagine how too much too fast often results in getting stuck in the high zone, irritated, angry, exacerbated. But it can result in being in the low zone. And too little for too long often winds up getting us stuck in the low zone. But it could result in us being shot up into the high zone. We're all wired differently. Living with this COVID-19 pandemic is kind of like having too much thrown at you too fast, too soon. Only instead of an individual experience, we're having an national experience, an international experience of too fast, too soon. We're hoping that by learning CRIM skills, you can learn to, when you're kicked into a higher or low zone, be able to get back into the resilient zone 
And if we're stuck on high or stuck on low, that's when experiences are more likely to turn into traumatic experiences. And if we can get back in the zone, then we're more able to process those experiences and integrate those experiences, cope with those experiences, so that unpleasant experiences don't have to become traumatic experiences. I'm not going to even try to pretend that these videos are a course in trauma. They're not. Like the, the stuff that I talked about with the ACEs studies, there's lots of good material out there on trauma, and you may well want to review it. Uh, I, do, I will put some links on some good material on trauma uh, at the end of the video. There's one small detail hiding inside that definition of trauma that we just spit out. You know, when we talked about dangerous experience or witnessing a dangerous experience, okay, who gets to decide what dangerous is? Now, it may seem like a trivial point, but I don't even want to tell you about all the times that I've reviewed a therapy session with another clinician and the clinician pauses the tape and goes, now that's not actually trauma. That happens to me all the time and I'm fine. No. Danger is all about perception. And the only person who has a legitimate perception of danger is the person who experienced it. So danger is what a person perceives as being dangerous, not necessarily what you perceive as being dangerous. And on the flip side of that, if you perceive it as being dangerous, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter whether it fits anybody else's definition. If you say it's dangerous, it's dangerous. One aspect of trauma that I do want to focus on, though, is that the language of trauma is not words. The language of trauma is sensations. Now, if you remember back to our tour of the brain, we said that words are part of the rational, the thinking brain. And when we become emotionally overwhelmed, we flip our lids. And the emotion part of the brain and the thinking part of the brain don't communicate very well. So, when we are in the midst of an emotionally overwhelming, dangerous situation, it is not at all uncommon for the thinking part of our brain, which is where memory starts, and the thinking part of our brain, which is where language lives, don't communicate very well. And our episodic memory of of traumatic events is often partial and incomplete. But our bodies remember, and our bodies remember traumatic events through sensations. As Bezel van der Kolk remember, uh, reminds us, the body keeps the score. And so we need to do one last piece of biology. I'd like to review the autonomic nervous system because the autonomic nervous system is the highway through which the body keeps the score. The autonomic nervous system is the highway that CRIM uses to communicate with the rest of your body. Now, the autonomic nervous system is located in the survival part of the brain that we talked about earlier, and it actually controls the automatic stuff that happens in your body. It sends signals to the body, gets signals from the body that control heart rate, breathing, digestion, the automatic stuff. Now, the, paras the autonomic nervous system can be broken down into two systems, subsystems. There's the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. But it might be easier to think about these as being the gas pedal and the brakes. The gas pedal is the sympathetic nervous system, and the brakes are the parasympathetic nervous system. 
Robert Sapolsky assures us that all first-year med students learn that the sympathetic nervous system is control of fight, flight, freeze, and fornication, although the med students probably use another term, and that we can remember the parasympathetic nervous system as being in charge of rest and digest. To put this into practical, easily understood terms, let's think about a runner running a race. The starter's gun goes off and the gas pedal gets floored. The sympathetic nervous system kicks into action. Adrenaline is released into the bloodstream, providing access to quick energy. Heart rate increases, breathing increases, and then bam, all of a sudden the race is over. And then we rest and recharge. And that's the parasympathetic nervous system kicking into gear. Can you see how the autonomic nervous system is reflected in the resilience zone? When we're rising up to meet challenges, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. And when we've met the challenges, the parasympathetic nervous system helps us to recharge. CRIM uses the architecture of the nervous system in order to help us get back into the zone, get back into balance when we've gotten knocked out. This is why CRIM works. CRIM uses the nervous system to access the wisdom of the body. Thanks for viewing this video on trauma and the autonomic nervous system. This video completes the chapter on the community resiliency model and why the model works. Please join me for the next video when we begin the chapter on the three core CRIM skills, tracking, resourcing, and grounding.